Um, Dr. Bargal is um, a man of many talents, uh, probably the most unique person in the world, I would say, because I don't know of um, anybody else, actually, who is a physician trained in allopathic medicine, a psychiatrist, and a yoga expert and practitioner, and also a knowledgeable expert in the area of Ayurveda. So um, Dr. Bhargav comes from originally from Nagpur, where he went to medical school. And then he did his uh, psychiatry training at Nimhans National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore in India. And then he did his um, another MD in uh, yoga at the S. Vyasa University, which is a yoga university in Bangalore. And he did a PhD as well. So he's an MD, MBBS and an MD and a PhD. Um, so in addition to being a scholar in all of these disciplines, he's a yoga practitioner himself of many years. And a, an our teacher, you will see probably hundreds of his video, video, YouTube videotapes um, of different aspects of yoga that he has taught. He's also a researcher and has published uh, fairly extensively on the applications of yoga to different medical and psychiatric disorders. And I'm um, myself, uh, we are privileged to have him as a visiting associate professor at my institution, in my department at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School. And uh, we're fortunate to have to catch him on the last week of his um, tenure with us. He'll be going back to Bangalore by the end of this week. And um, of course, as always, he is always connected wherever he is. Yes. So with that, let me pass it on to Hemant. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Keshwan. Uh, uh, so I'm really humbled uh, by your introduction. Uh, I'm just a student of uh, you know my teachers who have taught me medicine and also of the ancient seers uh, who kept these wonderful sciences alive for thousands of years so uh, uh, i am really you know privileged to have this wonderful opportunity to share with all of you you know whatever little i know about the fundamental principles of yoga and ayurveda therapies and how uh, they can potentially be applied in modern medicine So this is the overview of my presentation. Uh, I will begin with the current challenges faced by medicine today. And then uh, yoga as a tool to regulate the lifestyle. You know, I'll uh, give you an introduction about the fundamental Panchakosha model, which forms the basis of yoga as well as Ayurveda therapies. And then how these Panchamahabhuta, the five basic elements uh, you know, are the fundamental regulatory principles of the body, mind, and behavior. Then, of course, uh, we will understand the role of the gut. And then how the lifestyle changes suggested by yoga and Ayurveda uh, to bring balance into these factors can build resilience and help prevent and manage disorders. And finally, uh, I will show you some data related to our tele-yoga experience, and then I will conclude. Non-communicable disorders, you know, uh, if you look at it, they have come up as an epidemic of 21st century. We know that in the past century, people used to die, you know, due to infectious diseases, cholera, tuberculosis. These were major killers. But now these NCDs, specifically, if you look at the data, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, chronic respiratory diseases and diabetes. These four major non-communicable disorders are major killers. And uh, if you look at the, the amount of funding uh, that is being put year after year, you know, uh, the graph keeps on rising where more and more novel molecules are being discovered, more and more newer drugs keep coming into the market now and then. So you see that the amount of research funding that is given to find out a solution to these problems 
keeps on increasing every year. And ironically, the data also shows that the morbidity and mortality due to these disorders has also kept on increasing. So in a way, you know, these lifestyle disorders, we call them lifestyle disorders because they do not have a single pinpoint cause. Uh, we have not been able to manage them by the approach, the reductionistic approach of finding a single molecule. Now, why these non-communicable disorders have become a global problem now? You know, it is a problem of the developing countries. It is a problem of the developed countries. One is the sheer number, the number of cases that suffer from diabetes, heart disease, cancer. They are alarmingly rising. And the causes are multifactorial. If you try to understand, you know, uh, there are such complex interplay of the genes, the environment, the epigenetic factors. And these, these illnesses have a universal impact. They are chronic. They do not produce any kind of alarming symptoms in the beginning. It is a difficult, there is a difficulty in diagnosing them. And, and the current treatment approaches also add a lot of financial burden because from the tools of diagnosis to treatment itself, they are very costly. Here, one thing that we have to understand is when we say that these are lifestyle disorders, somewhere when we say lifestyle, we understand that lifestyle has four major pillars. You know, you talk about diet, you talk about sleep, physical activity levels, and psychological stress. So here, and of course, the, the uh, uh, habits. Now here, it is well known, you know, everybody knows that uh, they should follow a positive kind of a lifestyle. They should get up early in the morning, start the day with yoga and continue to, you know, uh, eat less fried, uh, you know, fresh green vegetables, all those kind of understandings people have. But why is it that the adher adherence to the lifestyle change is so difficult? Mm -hmm. So people know about lifestyle, but the compliance to that uh, is not appropriate. It is here that stress plays a very important role. You know, data shows that when people are, are stressed, you know, they find it difficult to go to gym, difficult to do any kind of exercise. They tend to go into a habit of binge eating or excessively use substances. Uh, so in, in that way, the stress and the mind forms the very core why this lifestyle solution, is, we are not able to execute it. Day in and day out in today's life, we are being exposed to internal or external demanding situation. External demanding situation is the situation that is imposed on me from the environment. You know, the, the area that I work in, suddenly some deadlines come up and I have to respond to it or some guests come up or there is some function or, or interpersonal stressor that come from family and relationships. Internal demanding situations are my own set points, you know, what kind of uh, expectation I have from myself, you know. So uh, the, the, the expectation of me for myself are set so high that I myself become a factor that puts stress on me. And when the system has to respond on these external and internal demanding situations, with this response, what happens is that we generate this upregulation of hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So there is uh, increase in the sympathetic activation. There is release of cortisol. There is release of adrenaline and all these, you know, uh, uh, allostatic load that goes up ultimately keeps on building in the body and reaches a certain threshold. And when it breaks, then depending on the weakest genetic link, it can bring derangement into your immune system, accelerate the aging process. And according to yoga philosophy, if you are good in willpower, you will be able to suppress it into the body and it will cause symptoms related to the organic body. But if the person is low in willpower, then it will manifest directly through his manomaya kosha, leading to psychiatric problems. So, or on the other hand, it can also lead to disturbances in your autonomic and uh, voluntary nervous systems. So the root cause uh, of the psychosomatic problems, the lifestyle uh, related problem is understood as the, as the uh, response to the demanding situation. 
Now, when you look at lifestyle, as, as I said, these are the four important factors, but why people are not able to follow that is because their mind says that we can do it tomorrow. You know, mind, mind doesn't listen. If the mind is, uh, is uh, ready, you know, if the mind is your friend, then following this lifestyle is easy. And if following this lifestyle is easy, then managing these problems is easy. But the mind doesn't listen. Why does the mind not listen? No. So here, very simple understanding that comes from yogic lore is that a speeded up mind does not listen. A slow, relaxed mind listens. So therefore, the speed in the lifestyle, we are in a hurry all the time. You know, Even if there is no reason for it, we want to finish things fast. So this speeded up mind finds it difficult to stop. This is very simple, you know, when the vehicle crosses a certain threshold, it is very difficult to take a turn on, but the vehicle is moving slowly, it will be more flexible. So in this way, the yoga-based lifestyle enhances compliance with the lifestyle change by slowing down the mind, by relaxing the mind. Now, this is a very, very important concept that, uh, you know, I, I wish to convey here on this platform. It is the Panchakosha model that comes from Taitariya Upanishad. Now, Taitariya Upanishad is a very beautiful Vedic text where there is a dialogue between Bhrigu, who is a student, with his master and father, Varuna. And Bhrigu asks a very deep question about what is this self? You know, um, from where is all, is all this creation uh, that has come has come up and where does it go? Or from where was I born and where will I go? And these kind of deeper questions are asked. Then his uh, master uh, does not give him a direct answer, but he asks him to do tapas, to uh, understand the deeper aspects of his own existence. So here, what happens is, um, he says that uh, when he does meditation, he first Understanding that Bhrigu gets about his own existence is that I am this physical body. And this physical body is sustained on food. So whatever I eat becomes me. So therefore, basically me or, 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 or as I exist, my existence is dependent on food. So he says that Annam Brahmeti Vijanath. I have realized that the whole creation or me myself is nothing but this physical body. Then uh, his master tells him, you have to meditate even more deeper. Then he meditates again for a few years, goes into the forest and meditates and then understands that subtler to the matter is energy. Then he says that everything is running on a subtle energy and it is the energy that governs the sun and makes it shine and, and it is the energy that sustains me, not the food per se. So then he says, Pranam Brahmeti Vijanath, and understand that there is a, another layer within the body and a few inches around the body. It is subtler than the body, but more expanded than the body. That is the prana. Then when his teacher asks him to further meditate, then he understands that this energy also has a direction. It always functions in a certain uh, kind of a direction that comes from an underlying intelligence. And, and that is thought. So thought moves the energy, energy moves the matter. So then he says that he understands that it is the thought which is governed by emotional energy that is the fundamental reason for movement of the physical energy. So he then says that Mano Brahmeti Vajanat. Now I understand that at the base of this creation, it is the thought, it is the emotion, the energy which is even subtler, that is me. Further, you know, as he continues deeper and deeper analysis, he comes to the conclusions that even subtler than the physical, the superficial layers of emotion that go up and down, the deeper, clearer thoughts of insight into any issue are more powerful. They can bring about a change, whereas the superficial thoughts are always moving from one extreme to another. That he understands as Vidnana Maya Kosha, the power of discriminating and the power of insight into any issue as the fundamental aspect of creation. And after that, when uh, his teacher tells him that you are very close to the answer, but I think you should meditate more, then 
when the disciple goes into the forest to meditate, he doesn't come back. You know? Then the teacher goes in search of him and realizes that he is just sitting in immense bliss. And in that bliss, you know, he has realized that fundamentally the core of existence is nothing but bliss. So this is how um, Brigu unravels these five layers of existence. Physical body, pranic energy, emotions, intellect, and the bliss. Now, according to yoga therapy, all the disorders, illnesses, develop at the third layer, that is the Manomaya Kosha. The last two layers, that is Vidnana and Anandamaya, are always perfect in everybody. Okay. From the Manomaya Kosha, over months and years, these deep-rooted emotional conflicts create a disharmony which creates and percolates down to the Pranamaya Kosha. And from the Pranamaya Kosha, these imbalances then go down to the physical body in Annamaya Kosha where they cause this uh, endocrine and electrochemical imbalances. And then later on, we come to the diagnosis that now I have developed heart disease, I have developed blockages, I have developed hypertension, I have developed uh, diabetes. So therefore, you know, modern medicine is still in Annamaya Kosha. They think that everything that is arising is within the frame of the matter itself. But yoga is very clear. Yoga says that these uh, lifestyle disorders where we cannot find out any pinpoint cause in the environment, they are coming from the Manomaya Kosha. Now, yoga divides all the diseases into two categories. One is known as Adhija Vyadhi and other is known as Anadhija Vyadhi. What is Adhija Vyadhi? Adhija Vyadhi is the disease that begins from a deeper layer within you. Diseases that begin in the Manomaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha. They are Adhija Vyadhis. What are Anadhija Vyadhis? These are the diseases that begin in the Annamaya Kosha. Either in the environment you know, that uh, brings the injury into you. Say, for example, if there is an infection, it is anadhija vyadhi. If there is a poisoning, if there is mm, any accident, injury, burn, or uh, uh, we can say um, uh, snake bite, all those kind of thing will come under anadhija vyadhi. So modern medicine was very successful in the past century when uh, we were managing the infectious conditions because they come from outside and the whole approach of modern medicine is also in the Annamaya Kosha. So they could search the environment and find the specific antidote of the problems. And therefore, it worked like a miracle. So whether these are infections, whether these are antidotes to the poisons, whether there is any accident or emergency situation, we can save lives by by uh, modern medicine you no know? but the the problem happened when the same approaches that were used to manage the anadhija vyadhi modern medicine started applying that on the adhija vyadhis so when the illness is caused by an outside agent the solution also is outside and then it is very successful but whenever modern medicine is not able to find out a single environmental cause, essential hypertension, nobody knows the cause. Diabetes, you know, there are multiple factors playing, but sure shot, nobody can say that this is the cause and effect relationship. Mm. Similarly, all major non-communicable disorders that we suffer through, most of them, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, most of them are idiopathic. We do not know the cause. Yoga Vashishta says, please, you know, understand that if there is no cause outside, then it is automatically assumed that the cause is inside. Now, if the cause is inside and you only use the solutions that are from outside, then you will never be successful. Of course, those solutions have role in controlling them, you know, at the level of the body. But you have to bring about deeper corrections into your prana. You have to bring a deeper connection at the level of your Manomaya Kosha. 
then only it is possible to reverse these disorders. You know, Dean Ornish and all, they were able to reverse the coronary, coronary artery diseases. With a proper lifestyle change within six months, they showed 22% reduction in atherosclerotic uh, plaque sizes. How that happened? It happened because it is not only that the imbalances was corrected at the level of the body. You know, at the level of the body, you can use medicines, you can use your diet, but then you have to correct the imbalances in your subtle energy levels. For that, there are specific yogic practices that are called as bandhas, mudras, pranayamas. And then when you try to go deeper into the mind and understand deep-rooted emotional conflicts, then they also can be managed by using subtler aspects of meditative uh, practices or following the principles of jnana yoga or karma yoga. Now, this the pancha mahabhutas, you know, as the fundamental regulatory principles of mind, body and behavior. These five basic elements, you know, if we properly look around within us and outside us, there is nothing else apart from these five basic elements. There is space, there is air, there is warmth, there is sunlight, that is fire, we have water and we have earth. When air and space component combine, they form the dosha that is called as vata. When fire and water combine, they form the second important dosha or the humor in the body known as pitta. When water and earth combine, they perform, they form the third dosha, which is kapha. Now, within the human body, you have to understand all three of them as certain fundamental physiological principles. You may not be able to see them exactly uh, anatomically, but physiologically, the movement in the body, the motility in various body systems is governed by vata. Even the nerve impulses that travel or even the thoughts that move in a stream in the mind, you know, they are all governed by vata. So, so kapha pangu pitta pangu panguhu mala dhatavaha. They say that all these doshas and dhatu cannot move. They require vata to move them. So the fundamental and the most important of all the doshas is vata. If vata is in proper balance, your digestion will be proper, your bodily movements will be proper, the removal of the waste products from the body will be proper. But if the vata is excessive, then it will simply enhance the process of degeneration. It will accelerate the process of aging. At the birth, the dominant dosha is kapha. At young age, the dominant dosha is pitta. As you become older and older, the dominant dosha shifts towards vata. In fact, I have been observing certain phenomena you know, in life as we observe. Whatever activity that we do, it begins with kapha, goes into pitta and then gets dissolved into vata. As simple as this discussion, you know, uh, that we have started now. In the beginning, uh, you observe that the speaker is little slow. He is, uh, you know, getting his thought process around. In the middle of the presentation, he reaches his peak. You know, he becomes very dynamic and uh, he starts giving the proper message of the whole presentation. And towards the end, if you see that he is dragging beyond the time, then you start losing interest and he also doesn't get enough energy to continue the presentation. So this happens with everything that we do, you know, as we start a thing, it is little slow, it reaches a peak and then it dissolves. So this is the way that doshas keep playing in the body. And uh, what human beings have done is through the advent of the technology, you know, all our exploration through science has been outward. So we have conquered in a way all these five basic elements. We have prepared dams in the rivers. We have gone and made tunnels in the seas. 
we have conquered this space by making rockets. We have reached the moon and the Mars. We have also been you know, able to harness the energy from the sun and made solar panels, vehicles. So in this way, outwardly, um, even you know, if these five basic elements are creating a kind of a havoc or disturbance in terms of extremes in temperatures, pressures, uh, rain or heat, we have developed our own defense mechanisms through which we protect ourselves. All this has been possible because of tremendous growth in the technology. But these five basic elements are also doing certain phenomena, phenomena and, and uh, functions within me. That has not been sufficiently addressed because the science and technology of what we call as the inner engineering is not known. When we say inner engineering, first we have to understand the whole structure, you know, the, the sense organs, the mind, the intellect, and the very core of our existence. All, you know, in Katho Upanishad, Yama tells Nachiketa that when God created human being, the sense organs were created in such a way that they are always drawn out. You know, but the whole journey of yoga is that you should turn them inwards. It is only some person who is a dhira, he, he calls him as a, as a dhira, some one courageous person only will become aware of this fact and will start an inner inquiry and start understanding the inner tools, you know, uh, and become uh, an inner engineer. So, the origin of yoga and Ayurveda, both of them originate from Vedas. Ayurveda is an Upaveda of Atharva Veda. Yoga is fundamentally for the first time mentioned in Rig Veda. So, it is Rig Veda and Atharva Veda that give rise to yoga and Ayurveda. And fundamentally, if you look at the Vedas, the most, the first part of Veda itself, the Brahmanas, they invoke all these five basic elements. In fact, in that sense, you know, yoga and Ayurveda principles are very secular because everything that is there is just praising these five basic elements, you know. So, so Agni has been given a lot of value. Varuna has been given a lot of value. Uh, Vayu has been given a lot of value. Akasha has been given a lot of value. And these deities, you know, these fundamental forces of nature have been worshipped. There is a very beautiful uh, Upanishad known as Aitareya Upanishad that says that each of these elements actually entered into the organs of the human body and is the deity of that particular organ of the body. The fire uh, entered into the body and, and it, it gave us the power of speech. You know, So, so why uh, speech is governed by fire? Because fire has the component of giving light, you know, and speech also has the power of throwing light into certain issues, giving insight to the people. The jnana can go through speech. So, therefore, uh, the deity for fire, for speech is fire. Whereas for the shrota, that is for the shravana, for the ear, the deity is space, Shabda Gunakam Akasham. And uh, if you look at uh, the eyes, you know, there again, the deity is the sun because eyes respond to the light. If there is sun ray anywhere, then only there is use of light. If there is no ray of the sun, eyes are useless. Tongue as a as taste organ uh, has water as the deity. In fact, whenever we want to test, you know, medically how dehydrated the person is, we ask him to show his tongue. You know, the more dry the tongue is, the less water he has. So the Aitari Upanishad says that for the tongue, the deity is water. And then comes the, the smell, you know. So the smell, the deity is earth. And this is very wonderful if you really, uh, you know, uh, uh, try to understand these uh, these things. 
one is subtler than the other. The subtlest of all these five basic elements is space. Now, space uh, cannot be felt by any of the sense organs. You know, only in deep meditation, the sound of the space may be heard. You know, so the ears uh, are the organs which can capture the subtlest aspect of this existence, the shravana. Then the, the next uh, uh, element that is grosser than the space, you know, is air. Now, air can not be grasped by seeing it, by smelling it, or by tasting it. It does not have taste. It does not have smell. And uh, we can just become aware of the air by touch. You know? So the skin is governed by the touch. And there the principal deity is air. Then, grosser than the air is the element of fire. Now, uh, air also has sound. So you can hear air and you can touch it. Hmm? But then comes the fire. Fire, what you can do with fire? Fire has the property of space in it. You can hear the sound of fire. When it burns, you can hear. Along with that, you also have the touch, that warmth of the fire. And one more organ get, gets added here is that you can see fire through your eyes. But you cannot do that for air and space. So the, 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 the sense organ that is particular and special to the fire element is the act of seeing, so the eyes. And then, then the grosser one is water. What happens with water? You can hear it. You can feel the touch of it. You can see it. But along with it, you can do one more thing with water and that is you can taste it. Therefore, tongue is the specific organ for the water element. And then comes the final organ that is earth. You know, earth, all other four organs, you know, sense organs can perceive it. You know, but there is one sense organ which is specific to earth and not to any other uh, four elements. So I would like to know how attentively you are listening to me. So can anybody tell me which is that organ? Which is specific to the earth element? Nose. Yes, superb. So here um, you can see the earth, touch the earth, taste the earth and you can uh, uh, but the specific thing that you cannot do with any other element, but only with earth, is smell. Now, this has its own medical applications. You know, so it tells you that which of the Pancha Mahabhutas is more dominant in a person, which of the Pancha Mahabhutas is not dominant in a person, and because these Pancha Mahabhutas are there in your diet. They are there in your whole environment. You can be prescribed a specific lifestyle to keep these Pancha Mahabhutas in a harmony. So the physical uh, aspect, uh, as I told you, are known as Vata, Pitta, Kapha and their mental counterparts are, told as, are called as the Rajas, which is more active, moving uh, kind of a principle. Sattva is more of a balance. And tamas is more lethargic, more drowsy, more dull, lack of people who do not take any initiative, you know, uh, insensitive. All those qualities goes into tamas. Rajas are the people who find it difficult to sit still, always want to do some or the other activity. They are highly ambitious and uh, result-oriented in whatever they do. Sattva are able to shift their gear and maintain a proper balance between both. So therefore, the most basic principle on which the yoga and Ayurveda therapies work, you know, are in the Annamaya Kosha, bring about a balance between movement, metabolism and lubrication. And in Manomaya Kosha, bring about a balance between Tamas, Rajas and Sattva. In the modern medicine, our approach is usually of, you know, blocking whatever 
you know, uh, uh, the signals in the body, whatever inflammatory markers that are getting secreted, we just block them. We use anti-inflammatory agents, antibiotics, uh, anti-prostaglandins. But here, you know, there are a deeper holistic um, uh, aspect of existence are explored and a fine-tuned balance is achieved. And it is very simple, you know, to reduce vata, you have to increase pitta or kapha. To reduce kapha, you have to increase pitta or vata. Similarly, to reduce tamas, you have to increase rajas. So the, the approach is that by regulating your lifestyle, by doing certain mind-body practices, by eating certain kind of food items, by following your biorhythms in a certain way, you should be able to uh, fine-tune yourself uh, using yoga and Ayurveda lifestyle. So here you see, these are the five basic elements at the uh, x-axis. And in the y-axis, I have put the three layers of Panchakosha model. So the Vata, Pitta, Kapha uh, are there at the body. And their pranic counterparts are Pancha Pranas. Prana, Vyana, Udana, Samana, Apana. This is very simple, you know. So you understood the five basic elements at the level of the body. Hmm? Now you as a human being sitting in front of me now, you know, you understand your existence mostly as this physical body and its physiological function and of course the thoughts that are going on in the mind. Now if I ask you, you know, what is your composition of these five basic elements? Hmm? Uh, it is more difficult to answer that from the pranamaya and manomaya uh, point of view. But at least at the bodily level, you know, if you are, say, say you are a 60 uh, kg, uh, your body weight is 60 kilogram. Can you tell me how much of air, water, earth, fire and space are there in that 60 kg? So we know that 70% of uh, the body is water and rest almost 30% is, is calcium, other minerals and that is earth. So apart from that, the fire, the air and space, they do not carry any weight. You know? In nature, anything, the weight, the mass, the, the, the property of being guru, guru is known as heavy. That property has only been given to these two elements that is water and earth and when both of them combine together they form kapha so therefore the more the body weight a person has he has more dominant kapha dosha in him you know and the lesser the body weight the person has you know there are two kind of people you would have seen in your life however more i eat i never put on weight you know so this is a person who is a Vata person because the kapha what that whatever he is trying to put the vata is blowing it away hmm? the space and air are dominant in his personality whereas there are other kind of people you know they say I fast and uh, very difficult to lose weight and little bit also if I eat normally not even more suddenly I put on weight hmm? so these are the people who are more of kapha Kapha dominant. They have the Kapha principle in them. And then there are people who eat food and as soon as they eat food, they're very fast in their digestion and very quickly they again become hungry. You know? And uh, they cannot tolerate the hunger pangs and their body weight is in the middle. Neither they are too much overweight nor they are too less, but they have intense hunger. These are the people who are, who are Pitta kind of a people. A general kind of a understanding. Because Pitta has, uh, has domination of the fire component in him. There is a reddish tinge in the eyes of such people. And uh, the eyes in, in, in case of Kapha will be very white, big, you know, broad, thick eyelashes. Whereas in Vata, you will see that the eyes may be a little uh, smaller, you know, and uh, a little bit kind of a dusky kind of a feeling you get in the eyes. Similarly, in the skin, you know, uh, a person with vata will have a dryness in the skin. 
and will have cold intolerance. Uh, and because uh, uh, there is more air in the system, whereas a person who uh, has a pitta or kapha will have more oily uh, kind of a skin and pitta will have the highest heat intolerance. You know, he will sweat very fast and will want always the AC or something to be on. Now, these are the physical characteristics, but when it comes to the subtle energy aspect of it, mm, there are energies which govern the physiological functions. Energies, uh, according to you know Ayurvedic understanding, these are known as the pancha vayus or pancha pranas. Uh, they govern the functions in different directions. So they have been classified on the basis of the direction in which they work. So there are energies that work with gravity. You know, so so if they are working with gravity, they will always move in downward direction. This Downward direction moving uh, energy will move with which dosha? Vata, pitta or kapha? What do you think? The downward moving energy will move with which uh, element? Isn't movement associated with air and space? Yes, but this movement is there in subtle energy and it is moving with gravity, you know. So, uh, movement in any direction, irrespective of gravity, is associated with air and space. You know, so that is known as the vyana prana. Vyana prana can move and circulate throughout the body. Gravity does not affect it. But the prana that moves with gravity in downward direction, that particular prana is the apana prana, and that goes with the water and earth elements because only those elements carry mass and you need mass to go with gravity correct so these are the subtler aspect of the kapha dosha now to micturate you have bladder which is down to defecate you have rectum large intestine they are also down and both of them move downwards correct so, this is the kapha dosha where you are seeing the, the, the water element and the earth element, earth in the form of mala, that is feces, water in the form of urine, move downward and their downward movement is governed by the apana vayu or apana prana. If this prana is blocked, you will have constipation, you will have prostatic hypertrophy, difficulty in urination. You will have uh, uh, irregular menses, amenorrhea. You know, uh, uh, and uh, if the lady is pregnant, it may the 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 uh, parturition may be delayed or obstructed. So all these processes are because of the blockage of the apanavayu. Whereas if this apanavayu is excessive, then the person will have incontinence. Person will have diarrhea and uh, uh, menorrhagia and all those kind of issues uh, will manifest. So this is about the downward moving prana. And then there is a prana that does the exact opposite function. It is a prana which moves upward. Can you tell me this kind of prana will be governed by which dosha or which element of the Pancha Mahabhuta, which goes against gravity? Air. Vata, vata. No. There is only one element that specifically goes against gravity. And that is fire. It is only fire that has the power of taking the rocket out of the escape velocity of the earth. The candle flame always goes up. Hmm? Air is everywhere. Air is not affected by gravity. It can circulate anywhere because it does not have that principle. But but my question was very specific, against gravity. It means anti-gravity. So that also needs a force. Only fire can do that. So it is the pitta. It is the pitta which has predominantly fire component in it that functions against the gravity. So in fact, the very speech that we say is a function of the udana vayu. Because 
the speech the dt for speech is fire and all the you know uh, reverse peristaltic functions vomiting belching speech these kind of functions and in fact they say that when this gross body the sthul sharira is dropped and then the jivatma has to go into another loka all these pancha pranas merge into udana prana the anti gravity prana and then along with the other kosha you know only the superficial annamaya kosha is dropped here and the pranamaya manomaya vidnana ananda all those four koshas as sukshma sharira go into different lokas and then they get back into another body and this way the jivatma keeps traveling so this is a very important prana known as the udana prana the upward upward moving prana and then this upward and downward moving prana need a balance the point where both of them meet is the navel region and that is the point that is called as the samana prana okay so samana prana is the point where the anabolism and catabolism the upward and downward Uh, uh movements are balanced in the body and it is the center of the abdomen where all the bile juices are getting released liver is releasing all its juices pancreas is releasing all its juices and the whole process of metabolism the churning of the food everything related to the balance the metabolism uh, is governed by the samana prana in the same way the prana that is around the facial region governing all the major sense organ is known as the mukha prana and vyana is the one that is responsible for circulating the nutrition and oxygen throughout the body that is the vyana prana so mukha prana and vyana prana are governed by the vata because the perception you know nerve impulses grasping movement all this is the vata function the digestion is mainly the pitta function speech is mainly the pitta function and removal of the waste products and all those Uh, functions is mainly the kapha function so it is in this way that in the subtle way these five basic elements manifest themselves in physiological processes in the body and then at the mind there are fundamentally there are two tendencies one is a tendency to act and overdo and a tendency to retract and and uh, underdo or rest or inertia so action and inertia these are the fundamental forces and therefore they these five basic elements manifest in the form of rajas and tamas so in the mind itself you know uh, in a subtle way these are only these five pancha koshas only that are functioning in the form of different kind of emotions and thoughts so can you tell me which is the element that governs the emotion of anger what do you think out of these five basic elements uh, which one pitta would... pitta yes yes so whenever a person becomes angry you know we say that oh he was very hot he was fiery very you no know, the fire so the in anger... marathi it's ke in marathi it said pitta khavalla pitta khavalla yes so even in anger you know a person says i will burn the whole world you know so so the burn comes with it so that is the fire principle that governs anger so therefore it is a good advice you know when somebody gets angry you give him a glass of water because now you are adding pitta into his uh, in, uh, kapha into his pitta so that will calm him down mm-hmm. as anger management tool we ask people to do prataka on the moon keshavan sir you would want to share something So I just want to say that um, the Sanskrit word for sadness is paitya. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so is that because pitta is is uh, underlies insanity? Yes, and our research, uh, in fact, the Ayurveda texts also say that it is the pitta jyotimada, which is the paranoid component of schizophrenia. You know, it is predominantly. Yeah. Yeah. the viparyaya that is coming from the pitta hmm? yeah. Uh, yeah so imbalanced pitta getting vitiated and affecting the manovaha shrotas generates paranoia and all those kind of aggressive tendencies in them hmm. yeah. similarly uh, uh, keshavan uh, may i request you to uh, repeat what you said 
it did not come through very clearly. Yeah, the Sanskrit word for madness is paitya. Comes from the word pitta. Paitya. Paitya. Yeah. So madness. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the person is going mad. It means that his mind is going out of his control because of excess of aggression or anger, and and that is all governed by the pitta. So the person you you see people around, you know, very short tempered people, very irritable. They are manifesting their pitta. And now, which is the emotion? Uh, you know, which is the element? Do you see or the dosha? Do you see? which is governing the feeling of compassion. What do you feel? Karuna. Air. Yeah? Anybody else? Air. Air. Karuna? Air. Is that Vata? Comes by which? Me. <laughs> So, Karuna carries Shitalata with it. Hmm? Sh this Shitalata uh, is the property of water. Hmm? So water flows like that. These emotions of Karuna, compassion, they have a component of flowing. And they bring coolness and calmness to the person towards which they flow. Okay? So, uh, water has that property of kindness with it. It soothes. It quenches the thirst. No? So, therefore, the, the component <clears throat> or the emotion of compassion goes with kapha dosha. Whereas, vata, you know, uh, goes with the thought processes which are more indecisive uh, unpredictability in the behavior hmm? uh, and switching from one side to another. That switch, you know, Vata does not have any direction. Now the air moves from right to left. In the next moment, it will go from left to right. So instability, hmm? instability uh, is the component of, is the manifestation of Vata in the psyche. So a children with hyper attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder are a classic example of Excess vata. Um, in the same way, uh, vata is also responsible for uh, inability to recollect things because it just blows away the information. So that is how even the dementias come under the categories of vata. You see in early Alzheimer and all, they also become very agitated and uh, uh, forgetful. So this, these are the manifestations of vata doshas. The aggression component, the positive symptoms of psychosis are a, or mania. You know, they are the manifestations of pitta dosha. Whereas if, you know, these uh, positive emotions are not able to generate it properly, then on the negative side, kapha can lead to depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how these five basic elements are manifesting themselves the physiological functions of the body, they are manifesting them in the movement of energies in the system and they are manifesting themselves in the form of derangements or arrangements of several emotions and thoughts in the mind. So there are several permutations and combinations. Uh, you know, these are the things which are happening within us, but we are not aware of them. We have never looked at them through these ways, you know. So there is a need for inner engineering development of a science and technology of inner sciences. You know, is there a mudra? These five fingers also are connected to five basic elements actually. You know, so when you combine the thumb with the index finger, you are actually combining the earth and water principles together. You know, so this gives stability. So it is known as jnana mudra. The mudra itself brings stability. So there are different mudras that can be used to activate different elements in the pranic system which is connected to your mental system. So there are mudras, there are different uh, kind of bandhas that can be done at the anal system, at the level of the abdomen, at the level of the throat and they can also modify 
the manifestation of these pranas and these five basic elements you know so there is a whole realm of this kind of a technology which uh, uh, is related to your breath to your body to your mind um, uh, and the meditative techniques also you know if somebody has problem with anger outburst anger management i will ask him to meditate on the moon you know or do trataka on the moon there is a person who has depression will do surya namaskara will will chant surya namaskar mantras so he needs more pitta whereas the person who is already uh, hyperactive and she has he needs more kapha so in this way in fact the right nostril and the left nostril the right one is connected to the pingala nadi that is the pitta the left one is uh, associated with the uh, ida ida is associated with the kapha hmm? so selective right nostril breathing increases pitta selective left nostril breathing increases kapha in this way yogis have used you know all these permutation and combination with the sole goal of achieving maximum stability and harmony within the system so that they would be able to transcend these layers of existence and reach the transcendental being but now we are using that knowledge as an offshoot for enhancing our health and overcoming the disorders so so this has been area of my interest and i always wanted to interpret the modern medicine and its disorders in terms of doshas and gunas so uh, so that is why what i did was i found out a vedic personality inventory all of you if you want to know you know which kind of gunas you carry in your mind you can go to uh, vedicpersonality.org and there are some 59 questions if you answer them it will tell you how much of rajas you have how much of tamas you have how much of sattva you have so what we did was we applied this inventory to patients who suffered from different kind of psychiatric illnesses and we also applied it in healthy controls you know relatively healthy control who were good healthy controls who were people who observed a proper lifestyle and performed yoga regularly so what we observed with our data was that sattva was of course highest in the healthy people but then after that these were the people who had anxiety and ocd that had higher sattva so you generally see you know the people who are very meticulous organized in their anxiety, they tend to get more anxious over small issues and sometimes um, over attachment uh, to perfectionism you know over attachment to being organized or doing things in a certain way can lead to some kind of a obsessive compulsive traits as well so so that went ahead with sattva component um then the least sattva scores were observed in psychotic conditions that is bipolar disorder and schizophrenia whereas rajas uh, was more in people with schizophrenia it was also uh, comparable you know in people with ocd anxiety and bipolar disorder but the least rajas score uh, that is you can say the fire component was observed in depression similarly the tamas highest of it was observed in bipolar and schizophrenia condition you know so uh, these are the patients who uh, were on medications and uh, uh, probably you know medications were also working there and but the our data showed that they had high tamas uh, and uh, then among the non psychotic disorder depression had highest uh, tamas and the lowest tamas was seen in healthy subjects as well as Uh, subjects who had anxiety and uh, ocd so it on the face value the data makes sense uh, you know uh, from the kind of understanding that we are trying to develop it makes sense and we also did some correlations and we observed that there was a negative correlation between tamas with sattva both in patients and healthy subjects and uh, rajas also correlated negative with sattva whereas uh, the tamas and rajas showed slight positive correlation that was observed in healthy subjects but not observed in the in the control group so the tamasic tendencies uh, the rajasic tendencies also encourage some tamasic tendencies so sattva count was countering both of them so why it is important to do this trans diagnostic approach what am i going to get by by interpreting psychiatric disorders from the yoga perspective from the ayurveda perspective what i am going to get is very important lifestyle tips which are mentioned in the ancient text so if i understand the disorder as depression as high tamas low rajas disorder i know now what kind of uh, lifestyle that i have to give him 
what kind of diet so there is a, there is ahara also you know? there is satvik ahar there is tamasik ahar there is rajasik ahar and then what kind of uh, asanas to give what kind of breathing practice to give what kind of chants to give how to design a proper yoga session and what kind of diet to give so rajasik person should be moved towards sattva whereas a tamasik person should be moved towards rajas in the beginning and then towards sattva you know directly it is difficult to move them and this is also very interesting you know uh, we see that in the hindu dharma excuse me may i ask you a question yes please yes please can you go to the previous slide please yeah sorry yeah yeah so um, you know the question i had was um, actually two questions for the rajasik personality you talk about yoga nidra uh at some point in time during your presentation do you uh, are you going to elaborate on that uh no uh, i am not going to go into the details of these practices uh because uh, the you know objective of this particular presentation is just to give you an orientation to the basic principles okay, okay. Hmm? uh but okay. i will so, okay i'll try to resources. I'll, I'll try to reach you i'll yes. try to reach out uh, separately on that Yes. and the second question was in the tamasic personality you talk about loud chantings and then a a a what that what does that mean yeah so this is uh, uh, known as the akara kind of a sound mm? uh, fundamentally uh, all the sounds that we produce you know they basically originate from three sounds you know a u and ma and uh, yes the a sound is the sound where the consciousness moves outward you know and connect to the external world the mandukya upanishad says that when the external world was created and the senses were created to interact with it in a outward direction then the sound mm. that it was created is the sound a you know it activates the wakeful personality whereas the sound u yes. activates the dreaming thinking imagining personality whereas the sound ma activates the calm sleeping personality you know the withdrawn personality so this is the relationship mm -hmm. of these a u and ma sounds with our movement of the consciousness externally in the mental space or within itself inward in fact in your day to day life if you properly see we produce this sound a you know in our day to day life uh, whenever we uh, are exposed to a sudden external uh, stimuli say somebody comes and pricks a pin on you you will say ouch ah you know the pain because your awareness is going in a mm. spurt outward or if you want to lift a heavy object you will say ah you know like that you gather energy in your hands and you want to lift it right so that is the sound the external the vaishwana or purusha moves externally whereas the sound mm the humming sound is when a mother wants a baby to sleep in her lap she produces this sound mm you know the humming the baby also does that before going into sleep very interesting yeah and uh, say imagine that you are very hungry and you uh, get a very nice uh, say chocolate pastry and you love it and and you just put it into your mouth and you say yum Mm, the mm component comes in you want to absorb mm. it take something within you turn inwards then the sound is mm and then when do you produce the sound oo it is exactly not oo as we as we utter it it is like you just keep on producing the sound a ah, and gradually close your mouth then when your mouth is just barely open that sound of oo comes you know it is like Ah, yes uh, now it has become o oh, oh. hmm? so when do you do that o oh, sound hmm? when uh, say uh, you want to recollect somebody's name and it is not coming into your mind you say you um, yeah um, i <laughs> <laughs> hmm? so you are churning your mind you are throwing your consciousness in the mental space to find out that name that word so this is uka mm. so in here what we are suggesting is that people who are rajasik they should do more humming 
they should turn themselves inwards because they are already drawn too much out. Whereas people who are tamasic, they are already drawn in, they are sleepy, lazy, inactive, socially withdrawn. So they have to open up and mingle mm. outside, you know. So this is the way we use these sounds. Fundamentally, the whole understanding of the word om is this, a, u, and ma, you know. The the Aitari Upanishad, the Mundaka Upanishad gives a very beautiful shloka. It says that, imagine that the Om is the bow and your Jivatma, your soul is the arrow. And using that bow, you know, you target the Brahman and let mm. the arrow hit the goal. So when you chant Om, what kind of bhavana you should have? With A, you should feel the sthul sharira. With U, you should feel the sukshma sharira. And with Ma, you should feel the karan sharira. And you are doing a regression. You are moving inwards. So imagine a bow which is turned inwards within you. And you are chanting Om. With A, you gather your sthul body, the external body. With U, you gather your subtle body. And with Ma, you gather your causal body. And where do you aim? You, you aim right at the core of your existence inwards and merge into that Brahman. So it is in this way, you know, mm. that Om should be chanted and imagined. Okay, so... Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for a very interesting question. Um, now this, you know, particular understanding of Varna system is being criticized, you know, in Hindu Dharma or Sanatan Dharma. But this was very, very scientific. Very, very scientific. And it was actually the big five personality trait that we talk about in psychology now is very much related to the characteristic that have been described, you know, about these fundamental Varna-based systems. Brahmanas uh, are the people who observe openness to experience. In fact, in Brahadaranyak and other Upanishads, there is a clear definition of Brahmana and it has been clearly mentioned that nobody becomes Brahmana by birth. Person becomes Brahmana by his karma or, or anything or, or, or his attitude. So intellectual curiosity, openness to experience, a jnana yoga type of a person who is more analytical, wants to question, that kind of a personality is a brahmana. Whereas Vaishya are the people who are planners, who are organizers, who are mind naturally goes into numbers and finances. You know, these are the people who, who want to uh, organize an event, who want to plan everything, chalk it out. These are people high in the big five component of conscientiousness. And they have rajosatva, kind of a mental trait, and they are the people who will benefit most by the Raj Yoga kind of a practice, which is a systematic, organized, actual practice of yoga. It is not about philosophy. It is the practice of mind, body, breath, pranayama, asana, dhyana. Then Kshatriya are the people who are energetic, assertive, they are powerful. They seek stimulation. These are the people who want to go into army, who want to get into, you know, uh, uh, the profession that demands boldness. They are having the extraversion component of big five. They are pure rajas. And these are the people who cannot sit still even for a moment. So these are the people who benefit by the karma yoga kind of a philosophy. And shudra are people who like to serve. You know, they... These are the people who want to cook for others and feed them. When others eat, they feel satisfied. They are friendly. They are compassionate. They are, they are dominant with the agreeable uh, trait of the big five personality. And Tamusatva here comes because they are very soft in their emotions. The water component is more. And uh, they have a tendency of little bit being, you know, surrendering in attitude rather than taking action into their own hands. That is perfectly all right. They just want to surrender to somebody. They don't want to take any decision. They say, okay, you decide. You know, These are the people who enjoy that kind of a, a existence. And they are Shudra type. You know, So they benefit by Bhakti Yoga. In fact, by that way, these are the people who get into medical professions, who get into nursing You know, or, or Mother Teresa. These are the people who are the Shudra and such beautiful people. You know, So we have to understand these uh, Vedic psychology with much more openness. <clears throat> so with this kind of a background, I quickly go into the Prakriti types, how these Vata, Pitta and Kapha decide the Prakriti of a person. So as I told you, there are certain characteristics of these doshas. 
the dryness, lightness, mobility, too much of talking, speedily talking, you know, intolerance to cold. And these are all the characteristics of Vata. Heat, penetrating memory, you know. Uh, then there is a, uh, in Pitta, the, whatever, there is more oiliness. Whatever comes, it uh, spreads very fast with Pitta. And there is tendency to have this uh, sour kind of belching when Pitta is more and person feels hot. Whereas the Snigdata, oily component, softness, smoothness, sweetness, heaviness, coldness, all these are the uh, characteristics of Kapha. Now, just imagine, you know, uh, some personalities in your mind which you can think of as a Vata kind of a personality. Hmm? A, a major Vata personality was Mahatma Gandhi. Hmm? So, he always used to walk, walk, used to walk very fast. When he would walk, people would not be able to catch him. Very thin and lean, you know. So, uh, so these are the kind of people. And with age also, Vata little slowly goes up. And uh, these are the characteristics that uh, come up with Vata. Then in Pitta, uh, personality, we see a lot of aggression coming up. People are, you know, decision makers and they want to enforce things with a lot of force. And uh, uh, they are go-getters, highly ambitious and can't tolerate failure at any cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the personality... So, hey, man, uh, who is the person below Trump? Oh, he's Amit Shah. He's Narendra Modi's oh. right hand. He's the Home Minister of India. So what does he represent? So he's uh, he's Pitta because uh, the way he removed the Article Three Seventy and the way he manages the whole uh, the Home Ministry, you know, it is quite aggressive in his approach and wants to execute his plans and and that is the personality, you know, as a uh, fire fire component. Yeah. That yeah. is being represented here. And these are the people, you know, Lata Mangeshkar, you, you remember her voice? You know, you just listen to it and you want to sleep or you want to just feel that calmness and relaxation, you know? So these are uh, the uh, kind of uh, personality that you see or Atal Bihari Bajpayee in his youth, you know, how slowly he, he, would, he would talk. After telling one sentence, you have to just wait for a few seconds to listen to him again, you know? And how... You know, every word that he speaks, how much weight it will <clears throat> So, these are the classical examples of a Kapha personalities. Now, <clears throat> so Vata Prakriti needs to be nourished and restrained. They have a tendency to be more, you know, overactive. So, some restraint. And Pitta Prakriti needs calculated advice on food and behavior because they have strong appetite and and uh, uh, in their behavior also, sometimes they become too intense. Whereas Kapha personalities need more motivation. And depletion, in a way, we say that in Kapha also, the appetite is large and there is a tendency to gain weight. Now, I, I you know, bring this very, very important component, which is known as the four types of fires in yogic literature. They are known as the Chatur Agnis, the four fires. And the yogic texts talk, talk about the relationship of one fire with another, you know. And this is how it connects the gut to the brain. Mm -hmm. So the first fire is the fire that is right there in the center of our body. So you have to imagine this body as a, a, a havan kund, you know, where a havan is continuously going on, going on, a yadnya is continuously going on. And in that yadnya, in the center of that adnya, yadnya, there is fire. Now, whenever you eat food, you are putting an ahuti into the yadnya, into the yadnya fire. So, if the fire is strong, you know, you can put heavy ahuti also and it will digest it. But if the fire is weak, you put a heavy food, you know, then the fire will get dampened or the fire may completely go away. So how do you know that your fire is good? Your fire is good if at correct time of your meal, you feel hungry, intensely hungry, you know, then the fire is good. Whereas if it is, if you are a person who can 
just skip a meal and you have to eat food only because it is a time to eat food, then the fire is not doing proper. Now, this Jatharagni is connected to the metabolic fire. Now, at yoga and Ayurveda literature understands Sapta Dhatus, you know. So, with the food that you eat in the stomach, you make rasa. Rasa is the, the assimilated, you know, when all the juices mix with the food, whatever that is formed, the broken and assimilated uh, juices, that is known as the rasa, mixed with food. Now, when this food is completely burnt, when the fire is good, then none of it remains. Mm? Then it is known as a good rasa. Uh, and that rasa gets absorbed into the blood and forms the next dhatu, which is rakta. Whereas if the food is not properly digested because the fire is weak, then this food itself forms ama. Now, ama is, according to Ayurveda, you know, you may... Uh, you may call it your harmful lipids that get absorbed into the blood, LDL, VLDL, or you can call it the oxidative stress, the free radicals, all of them get absorbed into the blood. So AMA also gets absorbed into the blood or if it is properly digested and the rasa has been made, that also gets absorbed into the blood. Rasa nourishes the saptadhatus one after another, whereas the AMA blocks, it blocks the nourishment of the further dhatus. So in the blood itself, when the ama comes, the symptoms of ama are you feel very drowsy, very dull, very demotivated to do any kind of activity. There is a tendency to have constipation and uh, 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 the ruchi in the food, that kind of a taste in the food is lost. You don't feel the taste of the food. So that all suggests that right now there is ama in your body and langhanam paramaushadham. That is the time that it is recommended that you only drink hot water or drink a jira kashayam, which slowly, slowly ignites your fire. So cumin is considered as a very, very wonderful herb to ignite the digestive fire. So whenever you feel that there is an inflammation in your body, usually in the early phases of viral infections, you go through this kind of a phase. And if you understand it from the Ayurveda perspective, this all these viral infections are nothing but ama. In fact, it is first the imbalance in your digestive fire. The fire is very deeply connected to your mood and emotions. So the fire gets disturbed. With the disturbed fire, you eat food that is heavy, difficult to digest. And then you start developing sneezing. Mm -hmm. So the sneeze is actually a connection of the samana prana with the udana prana. So the udana prana is getting imbalanced. After that, you develop constipation and uh, bloating in your abdomen and loss of appetite and the apana prana also starts getting disturbed. And with these disturbances in the pranic flow, your immune system gets compromised. It is in this situation that the normal innocuous ha harmless viruses which are around in the atmosphere, now enter into you and cause the viral infection. Mm? So there are five people in the family, but only one gets, other four don't get. Mm? So why does that happen? Why does that happen? Or even if some people get, they very quickly, they are able to come out of it in a day or two, but the other person suffers. So this is the resilience I am talking about. Mm? So if the Jatharagni is good, no viral infection can touch you. If the Jatharagni goes weak, then the rasadhatu becomes uh, vitiated by ama. This rasadhatu enters into the blood and dampens the immune system. And then you become prone for all these viral infections. So it is at this time, you know, if you want to stop it from progressing, first thing you have to do is skip a meal. First thing that you have to do is skip a meal. I don't know whether you have observed it in your life or not, but whenever you are in such kind of a situation and you have a heavy food, after having that food, your symptoms aggravate. They aggravate because you have further added more uh, uh, to the uh, uh, weak fire, further ahuti, that is creating further vitiated ama, which is further getting absorbed into your blood and it is generating further more inflammation. So, you have to understand 
that the whole system of Ayurveda is for the purification of the body and thereby enhancing the fire, the digestive fire, the Agni. The whole system of yoga is for cleansing the mind and enhancing the Darshan Agni, the cognitive fire. Yoga is for cognitive fire and Ayurveda is for the bodily fire. And both of them work by purification. First principle of purification is Prati Ahara. Pratyahar. Ahar is to eat. To eat not only through your mouth, to eat through all the senses. Prati Ahara means Anukul Pratikul. Opposite of Ahara. It means you do not eat from outside. You turn yourself inwards. So therefore, in Ayurveda, when you have Ama, first thing they recommend is you skip a meal. What do you do? You just take warm water, take four glasses of warm water, add four teaspoons of uh, cumin powder into it, boil it, make it half and keep on drinking this particular Jiraka Kashayam till you really feel hungry. And when you feel hungry, eat the food that is easiest to digest for the fire. Which is the food which is easiest to digest for the fire? It is the moong dal. Moong dal ka khichdi banana chai. And there you can also, you know, uh, add little bit of cow's ghee into it because that also ghee, cow's ghee has the property of dipana. It, it doesn't dampen the fire. It helps the fire. Whereas if you drink milk, if you drink uh, sweet items, if you eat bakery item, cake, uh, uh, cookies, they all have a dampening effect on the fire. Paneer uh, has a dampening effect. So uh, all those kapha increasing item, curd has a dampening effect. Except ghee, all other fat uh, food items, ice cream, all of them have a dampening effect on the fire. Ice has a dampening effect on the fire. So you, whenever you uh, are in the initial phases, you get a feel, I am going to fall ill. Just skip a meal. Take this Jiraka Kashayam. Take everything hot. In fact, hot water itself is considered as a uh, thing that can ignite your digestive fire. So if you are able to halt it there itself, you are preventing a huge problem from coming in. But if you are not aware of this knowledge, you keep on eating your food the way you eat and more heavy food and then you <clears throat> take antibiotics, you take anti-inflammatory agents, you take anti-prostaglandins and what you do is the ama that is there in your system, you know, uh, starts creating a blocks in further dhatus. It accumulates there. It just, uska sirf shaman hota hai. Wo side mein chala jata hai. It just rests in the side, uh, in the tissues and uh, over a period of time, as this ama keeps accumulating, uh, it uh, gets into deeper and deeper imbalances. So from rasa, it goes to rakta. At this level also, we can manage it nicely. From rakta, it starts going into mamsa. Then at this point, you know, you start reporting chronic pains. You say, yeah, I have this neck pain. I'm not able to get up. I have this uh, stiffness in my body. Stiffness is ama. Chronic pain is ama. Hmm? And it is in this way, the fatigue, the lack of enthusiasm and all those, the epidemic of chronic pain that is going on right now. You know, it is all ama getting into the mamsadhatu. And then if you take opioids or painkillers, you are still suppressing the ama deeper into it. So from mamsa, it gets into medha, you know, then you have that kind of a tendency to uh, generate inflammation in the form of fat in the body. Now, recent understanding of medicine is that fat is nothing but an immune system, immune organ, you know, the, the adipocytokines that are released are the major risk factors for many, many cancers, especially the, the retroperitoneal fat. Mm, the fat in the breast tissue and the other. So this particular ama, which is not managed even at the mamsadhatu level, goes into the fat. And it is a inflammatory fat. Mm. And then from the from the uh, 
medo dhatu it then starts creating imbalance in the asti dhatu so people uh, get the tendency to put on even if they are vata prakriti you know they develop abnormal distribution of fat in the body accumulate more fat in their peritoneum and then you develop the problems related to the metabolism of the calcium and hormonal imbalances hyperparathyroidism hypo hyper thyroidism and all these deeper imbalances come up and then finally it goes and affects the shukra dhatu so there is polycystic ovarian syndrome there is reduction in the sperm count there is lot of infertility that is going on and this is how from a very simple principle of you know having food or or, or maintaining your jatharagni uh, with the kind of food that you eat we start getting into more and more more and more complex and complex problems because we just use the approach of suppressing them superficially by taking modern medications okay. so if we are just able to prevent it by doing a very simple way you know of fasting you know overall what we are doing nowadays is we are eating much more than what is required for us so uh, the, there is no problem in eating like that but we are not doing anything to strengthen our digestive fire uh, in proportion to how much we eat so our lifestyle is such that there is a tendency to have a weakened fire remaining awake late till night dampens your fire sleeping less hmm, dampens your fire sleeping too much dampens your fire sleeping in the afternoon dampens your fire hmm. so in a way extremes of emotions dampen your fire so when samatvam is there in the mind there is samatvam in the fire in the body also so this jatharagni agni is connected to the dhatu agni this dhatu agni is connected to the darshan agni this darshan agni is not only your vision it is also the perception of all this through all the sense organs you know for perception you need sunlight and that is nothing but fire so therefore people who develop the uh, the visual acuity related issues you know myopia hypermetropia they are also imbalances of from this uh, problem of uh, agni so darshan agni darshan agni is also with the eye and uh, because eye is connected to the has surya the the sun uh, as uh, her deity and because that agni has gone weak you develop specks you get specks and then uh, finally this particular agni of perception going weak the gnan agni the fire of knowledge the insight at the vidyanamaya kosha also get dampened so krishna says in bhagavad gita yukta hara viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu yukta swapna avabodhasya yogo bhavati dukha one who observes moderation in eating neither eats too much nor eats too less neither sleeps too much nor sleeps too less neither does too much of activity nor runs away from his duties it is only that person that gets established on the path of yoga and for him yoga becomes the destroyer of all the sorrows of the life it because then only the insight of knowledge the bliss of uh, uh, yogic practice will come from within you then only your vidyana and anandamaya kosha will manifest themselves to you and there will be a destruction of the sorrow so this is a typical text from charaka samhita you know where how do we manage a patient who has all this vitiation of these doshas uh, and we want to do a deeper correction and of course this should be a non invasive procedure where say i want to remove all the ama that you have accumulated in all your sapta dhatus what will be my approach so see how beautifully these sages have come up with this particular technology which is known as the panchakarma what do we do there is a fire in your center as your digestive fire which is a yajna and here you put food as the ahuti so first thing that i tell you is okay so let me now give you a certain herb which will ignite your fire but at the same time you start taking a diet which is easy to digest this is the first step this is known as deepana and pachana deepana means putting up the fire pachana means enhancing the process of digestion 
So three to four days, I will tell you to take Jira Kashayam. Three to four times a day. And at the same time, I will tell you that you just have to eat rice or dal or moong dal khichadi. You know, very, very easy to digest uh, uh, kind of food items. And continue this for three days. Then there will be certain lakshanas. I will, you will be able to say that I feel very hungry and want to eat more. So I understand that now your fire has come to proper balance. Then what I will do? I will use certain medicated ghee. You know, the, the clarified butter, which is, uh, 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 we can say, fortified with certain special kind of herbs that are decided based on your prakriti, whether you are a vata dominant, pitta dominant or kapha dominant person and vikriti. Like currently the symptom that you show are vata, pitta or kapha dominant. Now what I will do is this ghee will be put into your well ignited fire. Whenever you put ghee into fire, what does what happens? Fumes come up. What happens to these fumes if you do it in your home? The fumes spread throughout your home. It, it goes and attaches to each and every wall, each and every corner of your house. Purifies the whole air in the house, whole space in the house. In the same way, this particular grita mixed with fire and that medicine makes a rasa. That rasa goes and because ghee, you know, has a property of being a wonderful carrier, effortlessly it crosses the bilipid membrane of the cells and takes it throughout the body. Hmm? See how scientific it is. They use grita. Hmm? Only grita could cross that bilipid layer and take that herb everywhere in the body. So what you do first day early in the morning after you know, correcting your fire, you take 30 ml of warm grita, you drink it. Then keep on sipping hot water and jiraka kashayam till the grita is completely digested. What is the symptom of that grita being completely digested? You will get a burp but that burp will not have the smell of the grita anymore. Till it has the smell of the grita, still the grita digestion is going on. And then the smell completely disappears. The grita has been completely taken up into the body. Then again, you are advised to have a very light, easy to digest kind of food. Usually, moong dal khichari goes on in this period. And then next day, the grita quantity is increased to 60 ml. Next day to 90 ml next day to 120 ml. What I am doing is I am saturating each and every cell of the body with this particular herb and the grita. This process itself is removing away vata wherever it is accumulated in your joint, in your tissues, in your muscles, in your bones, in your reproductive organs, in your brain, everywhere, everywhere this grita spreads. Now grita is a combination of, from where does ghee come? The oil come? It comes from the depth of the sea. Depth of the sea has what? It has earth and it has water. So water and air combined, water and earth combined together are there in the all the oils. They are there in all the ghees. And it means they are kapha vardhaka. If they are kapha vardhaka, what they will do? They will block, block the air. Water blocks the air. Earth blocks the air. Water can also blow away the fire. Earth can also blow away the fire. So inflammation of pitta and the abnormal activity of the vata, you know, that goes away by spreading of the ghee. Mm? And it reduces the accumulated ama that has been there in each and every dhatu because the medicine that is given and the ghee itself has a, has a pradipta kind of a property. So it corrects the digestive, the, the, the fire at the saptadhatu levels. And then when you are completely saturated with this grita, it shows certain lakshana. This process is known as sneha pana. Sneha means grita. Sneha pana. So when this process is completed, you show sneha lakshana. What are those sneha lakshana? When we scratch your skin, it, it becomes oily. There is no marking. There is no white marking on the skin. Then what else? They say that when you pass your stools, even in the stool, the grita starts coming. It means it is no more absorbed. Then 
mentally they say that you don't even want to think about the ghrita. You become so saturated that there is a kind of a vomiting sensation that comes up even when you think of ghee. It means now you are physically and mentally saturated with sneha. There is no vata anywhere. And now, you know, whatever ama, whatever free radicals, whatever oxidative stress that you have been carrying into your tissues, that is being neutralized by the combination of the herb and the grita reaching each and every tissue of your body. Now what we want? Till now the movement have been from the stomach, you know, to the periphery, you know. Now we want this movement to again be back from the periphery back to the stomach. So it is from the koshtha to the shakha. Shakha gat movement hota hai. Aur uske baad mein, we have to give a complete body oil massage to you for two days. And after oil massage, you have to sit in steam chamber. All the pores of the skin open up with the heat coming from outside the outer temperature being more, the ghee melts and starts a movement towards the koshta. And But this time, the ghee and the herb combination are carrying along with it the excess of doshas from your dhatus which have been creating those abnormalities. So two to three days, this process goes on. And then what has happened is, without a surgery, we have reached each and every tissue of your body got the abnormalities, got the impurities, ama, oxidative stress from there, neutralized, mixed with ghee, back into your gut. And then comes the main, uh, these are all known as purva karmas. Now this is a preparation to remove the dosha from your body. Now is the main day where we throw this dosha out of your body. Either by giving you a medicine in the morning that will cause purgation. It will cause loose, loose motions depending on how much of, you know, ama is there. People get it from 10 to 17 times, you know. And in that time, you have to keep drinking hot water. So you are removing all those doshas from your system. Or another way of removing that, especially if there is more kapha dominant doshas are there, then you want to remove it, the phlegm from the chest and stomach and also you want to vomit it out. Whereas if the disorder or the uh, vikriti is more vata dominant, then they want to remove it by doing the enema through the anus, you know, putting the oil and then removing it. Or people also systematically do all the three processes to remove it from all the three directions. So this is how, you know, the imbalances that are created in the system because of the faulty lifestyle are removed by these beautiful Ayurveda procedures called as Panchakarma procedures. So this is what I was talking about. Now science is understanding. You know, now more and more uh, literature is coming up talking about leaky gut hypothesis that how, you know, the gut inflammation, the food intolerance that you have, how it activates the immune system, how the inflammation from the gut can actually cross over into the capillaries that are around the gut and how closely it is connected to your immune system. This is nothing but ama that is from the gut going into your blood. And then now they say that leaky gut idea is associated with a lot of problems, you know. So it, it causes depression in the brain, it causes ADHD, it causes autism, repeated sinusitis, rheumatoid arthritis, hypo and hyperthyroidism, skin inflammations, everything. This is not something that Ayurveda, you know, has been talking about this for years together, but now modern medicine. Pure modern medicine research now says that there are three lakh, three lakh, three kgs of bacteria in your gut. If you weigh the bacteria in your gut, so your body weight, three kg of your body weight is not your own at all. It is bacteria in your gut, which weigh three kg, three kg. Mm -hmm. And they create an atmosphere, you know, for the proper. So this is what we are, we are talking about the the proper digestion of the food when your rasadhatu is proper and your agni is proper. Hmm? When there is ama, there is disturbance in the gut microbiome. Hmm? And if you take antibiotic once, you know, we, we try to do uh, the gut microbiome research 
and we went to the expert. Okay, so tell us the inclusion and exclusion criteria. They told us the person shouldn't have taken even a single dose of antibiotic in the last six months. Otherwise, still the gut microbiota will remain disturbed. So you take one antibiotic to disturb your gut microbiome for next six months. One dose, huh? not one course, one dose. And gut microbiome is playing such a critical role in our immune responses, in all these kind of major uh, immune-related problems that we are facing, that uh, people say now that it is the gut-brain axis that is describing how the Parkinson's happen, how autism happens, how ADHD happens. And major uh, neurodegenerative disorders are going to the gut. Major inflammatory conditions of the body are going to the gut. And somewhere, uh, you know, dear friends, it is our ignorance of our own system, mm, our own inner world, our own inner world. We know much about our terrain, mm, but we know very little, very little about our own koshas, our own self. So it is here that this traditional system calls upon the attention of the modern medicine. And thankfully, attention is coming now, but there is not enough action, you know, in that direction. So this I have already discussed with you, the Panchakosha study. And finally, you know, I would also like to bring your attention towards Dinacharya and Ritucharya uh, domains. So Ayurveda recommends that there are certain kind of things that should be done throughout the day. You know, as soon as you get up in the morning, you should drink hot water. You know, they also recommend a process called as Gandusha where you take coconut oil, you know, uh, or almond oil, till oil, warm it and keep it in your mouth for a few minutes. Hmm? So what it does is that these kind of things uh, reduces the whatever dosha imbalance, vata excess vata that you have. But along with that, these procedures have also been uh, observed to reduce, you know, uh, the problem related to the gums, the repeated ulcers, or in fact, the local immunity, IgA antibodies, they respond better. Uh, and your this whole area, you know, becomes better. There is a technique of neti, the, the nasal washout, especially grutno neti has been suggested for uh, uh, enhancing the local immunity and also reducing the, the doshas and allergic tendencies. Then, uh, of course, they, they recommend that the food that you eat should be eaten two times a day. There should not be a breakfast or a lunch, but there should be a brunch that should happen between 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then in the evening, there should not be a snack separate and the uh, uh, diet separate, but there should be a dinner that should happen between 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So it is only two times a day when your pitta is highest. Pitta is highest between 10 to 12. Pitta is highest between 6 to 8. When your pitta is highest, fire is highest, why don't you put food in that time? So this is the common logic. Mm -hmm. So pitta follows a particular cycle. Vata follows a particular cycle. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you, you know, uh, get up uh, in the morning, there is kapha. Slowly, slowly in the afternoon, there is pitta. By uh, late afternoon, there is vata. Then again, what happens? In the uh, later on in the afternoon again pitta comes up and then in the night the kapha comes up when you have to sleep. So in this way you you manage, if you do not sleep in the night then the next thing is vata. So most of the people report this belching, gas, bloating and all night 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock that becomes the vata time again. So uh, if you remain awake in the night late it aggravates vata the next day. Similarly there is a seasonal uh, remnant. So Usha Pana is his early morning drink. Then you in the night while sleeping, you can put some nasya, some oil drops into your nostril because they enhance kapha. Best is almond oil. You know, Hamdard Shirin prepares a very good oil. So put just two drops into each nostril when you go to sleep. What it will do is throughout the day, your rajas has been active in the mind. That rajas will come down and you will be able to get into tamas easily and be able to have a good quality sleep. So, nasya in the night, at least once a week, you should do oil massage. Then after massaging your body with oil, you should do some exercise so that the sweat comes. Then that sweat also should be rubbed on the body. 
kept for at least half an hour and then you should take a warm shower and after that have food always have food after bath never take bath after having food because bathing itself ignites the digestive fire similarly exercise ignites the digestive fire oiling the body and then taking a bath ignites the digestive fire so in this way the best routine that can be recommended is that evening when you come back from your office you take a shower okay after taking the shower you have your dinner after taking your dinner just before you go to bed put two drops of lukewarm lukewarm oil it should match the body temperature into each nostril when you go to sleep in the old age it will do wonders you know very simple thing once a week give nice whole body oil massage to yourself using till oil sesame seed oil and regularly uh, keep a habit of drinking at least two glasses of warm water as soon as you get up in the morning and then after cleansing your bowels perform some uh, physical exercise and then take shower and then have whatever uh, brunch or see if you uh, uh, have a habit of uh, taking breakfast and uh, then you should try to have a very light kind of a breakfast like simple uh, you can have uh, dalia or khichdi or idli do not take very heavy breakfast if you want to have lunch later but ideally what you should do is you can just take little bit of you know uh, 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 say you want to take a chapati or little bit of uh, uh, bread or something uh, whole bread or something with the tea or coffee but then after that you uh, can straight away go for a full brunch and in the evening the earlier you finish your dinner the better is your quality of sleep later on because otherwise it has a tendency to create ama when you just eat food and sleep off similarly in the seasons uh, this is very beautiful that a particular dosha remains dominant in a particular season generally our common sense logic tells us that okay in summer pitta may be dominant you know whereas uh, in uh, in rainy season there may be kapha or winter there may be kapha but it is not like that uh ayurveda describes a beautiful process where it says that the sun that is shining in the summer you know is absorbed by the earth the heat is absorbed by the earth okay and it is the heat is then released back only later in the autumn so it is the it is the november december time when the pitta is more when you also feel that your appetite is good and people also you know if they exercise nicely they can uh, digest more food in this time and it is recommended to do good amount of vyayama it is also recommended that the frequency uh, of having sex you know uh, with the partner also can be more during the pitta or the autumn time because naturally the fire is more whereas in summer it is exact opposite summer there is a tendency to have more vata so here the appetite actually goes down you feel very fatigued very tired and there are the, you feel more uh, you know uh, you are more fragile also the system is more fragile also so here the sexual contact has been recommended to uh, once in two weeks and uh, uh, the the food that is to be eaten is to be is is should be very easily digestible kind of a kind of a food item during the uh, monsoon season also there is vata but the vata starts from summer and kapha is in the spring so the logically if you try to understand what is happening here is that the the sun first shines you know and whatever heat that sun generates that is absorbed by the earth okay and that heat comes out in the autumn time as pitta and then when it rains whatever rain that comes is absorbed by the earth and that rain comes as kapha later on after the autumn you know in the spring season and then the uh, during the the autumn season whatever coldness was there whatever wind was there that is absorbed and it skips a season and that comes back in the late summer and uh, monsoon season the vata increases 
So this is how the cycle of the seasonal regimen goes on. So one should try to see that and, and change the lifestyle accordingly. So this I already described you what kind of Ayurveda therapies and different kind of herbs that are used to nourish different kind of dhatus and these are more complicated things which we can skip. So finally, you know, people say that there is, is there any difference between yoga and exercise? So asana produces a very different physiological effect as compared to the exercise. We see many people, you know, who are very fit going regularly to gym are suddenly developing these heart issues now, especially post-COVID. You know, so here the reason I feel is that probably exercise is acting as another stressor for their system. They don't sleep in night properly. They don't get proper rest and then uh, they feel guilty about it and then they uh, try to do extra exercise because they want to maintain their body in their shape and that takes a toll on the system. Whereas yoga is not like that. Yoga is thiram sukham asanam and it, the relaxation is a very, very important component. Mindfulness is also not there in exercise. So it further increases the stress. Mind keeps wandering. So therefore, <clears throat> we also see that there is certain psychology of these asanas also. When a person is sad, he feels closing down himself. You know, whereas when a person is happy, he he actually adopts a more open posture. So there is a psychology uh, behind suggesting hands in and out breathing, chest opening kind of asanas in depression. Whereas when you feel more insecure, more anxious, you know, you want to bend forward and do Shashank asana and those relaxing uh, kind of uh, postures. Similarly, these emotions are also connected to the breath. And studies have shown that with different kind of emotion, the breathing pattern also changes. Fear, uh, you know, agitation, meditation, they all lead to different breathing patterns. In fact, uh, people have done, you know, uh, tried to understand the expansion of the chest, you know, through plethysmography, whether the, the pattern that it shows with different kind of breathing is different. So they have observed that... Uh, uh, the sadness breathing is more interrupted inhalation and abrupt exhalation. Whereas if you look at the last part of the graph, here the inhalation is more abrupt, but exhalation is more prolonged. That is the breathing of joy. So therefore, we give certain breathing regulation also. You know, We tell them to breathe in for four count, but breathe out in eight count. In that way, we can uh, use these interventions and... Uh, Right is Surya and the left is Chandra, as I already told you. And there is definite connection uh, of breathing through the nostril. The areas of the brain that get activated when you breathe through the nose do not get activated when you close your nose and do the breathing through your mouth. So, therefore, the pranayama carries a lot of uh, scientific basis. And uh, down regulation of the arousal has been known when you reduce your breathing rate by you know, below six per minute. So breathing can activate the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, or can bring the parasympathetic nervous system and we can use it. So this is the reference that shows that the left is Chandra and the right is Surya. And we have done some researches where we were able to show that even these ultradian rhythms are left and right carry a lot of significance. Hmm? And they can be used in applying yoga therapy or following a particular kind of a lifestyle. Say if you don't get pro proper sleep in the night, you want to close your right nostril, breathe in from the left and breathe out from the left. So that is left nostril should be activated in the night when you want to sleep. Whereas when you are starting your day in the morning and throughout the day you want to be active, it is better to do a Surya Anulom Vilom Pranayam. Close the left one, breathe in from the right, breathe out from the right. Okay. So we have done some researches that show that contralateral brain areas are affected by these kind of breathing. I will not go into much of details, but there is sufficient literature that shows that there is clinical application of selective nostril breathing. Right nostril breathing is also better for enhancing pulmonary function activities and cardiorespiratory resilience <laughs> and uh, heart. So now uh, this is my final uh, you know, discussion with you. Generally, you know, all of us have a certain tendency to tackle stress, you know. 
are you a person who tackles the stress by deeper analysis how do you cope or are you a person who copes by keeping yourself more and more busy or uh, you want to share it immediately with somebody you love you cannot keep it inside you as soon as you are stressed or you just deny no i am not stressed at all you know there is nothing that has happened but things affect you but you do not show it so one has to analyze one's own personality how do i cope naturally these are your genetic tendencies which you have been carrying from many many lives so based on that you can actually choose which path of yoga you want to follow so if you are a analytical person you follow nyama if you are action dominant follow karma yoga if you are bhakti yogi you are emotion dominant you follow bhakti if you are will power dominant you follow the raj yoga and all these paths or options were given by arjuna by krishna to arjuna mm -hmm. so in all these uh, systematic uh, chapters you see in bhagavad gita these approaches have been given and these are spiritual personalities who have actually evolved ramana maharshi evolved by gnana yoga who am i mahatma gandhi was a karma yogi he would not spend even a moment you know when he would not uh, be busy in socially useful productive work whereas mother teresa surrendered to god she saw god in children and leprosy patients and swami vivekananda simply you know did not give up his meditation yes, practice in any situation and ramkrishna paramahamsa actually manifests qualities of all of them he has traversed all the four paths alone so this is the way you know we uh, do some uh, you know yogic psychotherapy yoga based philosophy based psychotherapy and recommend certain literature for people to read and govern their life and follow certain lifestyle things and uh, yoga practices have also been able to protect the loss of brain areas you know this is vata with age vata reduces the kapha in the brain so yoga practitioners are able to reduce it because yoga reduces vata and this is the book that we have published where we have described these basic principles and also provide our yoga modules that we have validated for various psychologic psychiatric and neurological disorders so this book is available in amazon and uh, kindle version is also available you may want to have a look during the pandemic times you know to manage uh, the stress we started these online sessions and we were able to publish this uh, results where people showed improvement in their well being and reduction in stress during lockdown and now also we are running these sessions for stress management from monday to friday and it starts actually at 6:50 am ist you know i know it may be too late for you here but once in a while probably every tuesday if you have time you may want to attend it if you are doing it after your dinner then better not to do the fast breathing practices only do the slower ones on every tuesday we also have some philosophical discussion in these sessions uh, so it will be monday evening for you where you can actually log in and interact with us so my final message is that integration should happen like a football team mm -hmm. the people who are bending forward here are center forward they attack whereas the people standing behind are the goalkeeper and the defense they do not allow the goal to happen so the center forward are the people from modern medicine and the people standing behind are the yoga and ayurveda so they should come as a team together you know then only we will be able to help our patients optimally so the take home message is that integrative medicine integrating best of traditional and modern methods scientifically is feasible and a potentially useful approach that can enhance efficacy of modern medicine and reduce its side effects and uh, it needs high quality multicentric research and some premier institutes like nimhans harvard you know they should and i request all of you you know to to show interest in this area and plan some systematic documentation and research i thank all my gurus all my collaborators i am also grateful to professor macheri keshwan who uh, gave me this opportunity this is the whole team 
know that has been working in this area and we have been learning from each other for last more than a decade now and uh, uh, here i would also like to acknowledge you know the support that we have received from the government of india which is promoting the indian systems of medicine in the modern medicine setup in india now thank you thank you very much Uh, thank you <clears throat> thank you